Good morning, church. The scripture reads as follows. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will do away with both of them. However, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God raised up the Lord, and will also raise us up by his power. Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? So should I take a part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says, the two will become one flesh. But anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. Now in response to the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because sexual immorality is so common, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife. And each woman should have sexual relations with her own husband. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise, a wife to her husband. A wife should not have the right over her own body, but her husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have right over his own body, but his wife does. Do not deprive one another, except when you agree for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, otherwise Satan may tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And this is the word of the Lord. Real talk. I know the topic of sex is not necessarily a positive or a good topic for all of us. I know. I know that when I use the word sex, or even introduce the theme good sex, that some of you might feel anxious, and that some of you might feel scared about what we're going to say and also what you might experience. Fam, the world is so broken, I know that some of you might even have been abused sexually. So that when I say the word sex, or when I talk about sexual intimacy, or even your own body, it does pull all of your triggers, and you might experience something in this sermon this morning. I know, because I know you, <laughs> that we have a diversity of marital statuses in the house. I understand that not everyone is married with kids like I am. I also know that this might be an odd experience for you, to have a sermon about sex with everyone in the house. And it might be an odd experience for you also because of your church background. It might be something that you were never exposed to. I want you to know, as Reino, your brother in Christ, that I see you, that I know you, that I care for you, that I love you, and that I prayed for you, I prayed over you, and I prayed about you this whole week as I was prepping this sermon. This is a safe space. We are a family. And this is a family matter. And that is why we are talking about this this morning. So take a breath and relax. Teenagers and parents of teenagers, listen up. You will hear today that sex is a gift from God it's part of our lives as humans, 
and it's for married adults. That's what you are going to hear today. No surprises. Teenagers, I want you to hear what sex is all about today. I want you to see how God made it and what He made it for. And I want you to feel free to ask questions about it. Firstly, obviously, your parents and primary caretakers, and then all the other adults in the house, because we are supposed to be open to speak about this. Teenagers, I need you to have the right view of this topic. And this is the best place to get it, in the Bible. At the end of this service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond, and I want to encourage you, exactly the same way I did last week, do not harden your heart, do not check out, and do not respond if you feel prompted to respond. Because I'm going to give an opportunity for you today to respond as an individual. I'm going to give an opportunity for you today to make a decision as an individual. And to respond to commit to good sex and all that it entails. In the weeks to come, we'll pray for married folk. In the weeks to come, we'll pray for parents, both married couples and singles. So there will be a time where you'll stand up with your spouse in unity. Today is not that day. Today is a day in which I'm going to ask you as individual to commit to the biblical view of sex, i.e. good sex. Just a note, this is like one big meal with different parts. Okay, so sex, marriage, parenting, they all go together, right? Because they belong within the boundaries of marriage. So it's like a big meal with different parts to it, right? Something substantial, meaty or protein, something salad or green filled with iron and the good stuff, some starch and carbs going here, some veg. It is one big plate. And we are supposed to view it all together at the same time. But because we want to take time in this series to look at each one individually, we are going to do them in different parts, okay? So today, the second installment of sex. Next week, marriage the week after that parenting. Are you with me? Okay. I want to ask you two questions. I'm going to ask it slowly. I'm going to pause. Then I'm going to ask it slowly again because I really need you to answer these questions. First question. How do you feel about your body? How do you feel about your body? Second question. Are you able to be fully present here and now? Are you able to be fully present here and now? Hold your answers. Tuck them away for later. We're going to get back to them. In our communication this week, I said, good sex is glorious. It wasn't clickbait, fam. I was serious. It's a loaded statement. Short sentence, but I mean it. So question, how can we have good and glorious sex? There you go. Honor your body. Go for glory. I'll explain what that means. Wait. Give, repeat. That's how we can have good and glorious sex. Let's pray. Father God, we sung to you this morning in, in adoration and in a posture of humility and dependence on you as kids blowing kisses to a parent. It was such a great experience, Father God. You are great. It is your breath in our lungs. You are our Father. We are your kids. And we are who you say we are. And when we open up the Scriptures today and we read about our bodies and how close you are to us and what you ordained our bodies for, Father God, we want to honor you in our response. We want to hear from you everything that is both uh, uh, profitable to us, something that also might correct or rebuke us. We are open to the working of your Holy Spirit, Father God. 
So I pray that you would do that in us today. We thank you for the gift of Scripture. We thank you for the gift of a family of faith. We thank you for a Sunday that we can open up the Scriptures together. I pray that you would speak to us now. And may your name be glorified. I pray that you would have me speak the words that you want me to speak, Father God. We praise you that you have created us beautiful and in your image. We pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Song of Songs is a book in the Bible. It's beautiful. Song of Songs is about celebrating and exploring the goodness of sexual desire. Listen, celebrating and exploring the goodness of sexual desire. And Song of Songs is also about celebrating sex as an act of, big English word, consummation. Consummation means making a marriage complete. Did you know, interesting fact, that Song of Songs was read yearly in the synagogue during Passover week in the time of Jesus? Jesus Christ started His public ministry at 30. When Jesus was a boy and it was Passover, someone would open the scroll of Song of Songs in the synagogue and read the whole book. With everyone present. How is that for growing up with a positive view of sex? How is that for growing up with a biblical view of sex? Think about it. Like kids sat in synagogue, and when someone said the words sex and marriage and desire, the kids in the time of Jesus went, oh yeah, I've heard of that before. And what I heard about that is what the Bible says about it. And the Bible says that it is good. Fascinating, right? I didn't know that. I only discovered that this week. Last week, I quoted two passages in which the husband and wife look at one another in Song of Songs. I want to show you another passage from Song of Songs, and this is one of the closing passages of the book, right? So it's in the last chapter, chapter 8. And in this passage, the woman is speaking, and in this passage, the woman is saying, singing, and proclaiming what she's experiencing. It's beautiful poetry. Now, fam, I can read Hebrew. It's difficult already. Hebrew poetry, woo, what a vibe. So as I was studying <laughs> these verses in Hebrew, I probably read 15 translations. And eventually I landed on the Passion Translation as the one who I think translates the meaning of the poetry best. Okay? So if you have a different translation and you look at these verses, you might go, wow, wait, it looks a lot different. That's poetry for you. But let's read. Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 6 to 7. Fasten me upon your heart as a seal of fire forevermore. This living, consuming flame will seal you as my prisoner of love. My passion is stronger than the chains of death and the grave, all-consuming as the very flashes of fire from the burning heart of God. Place this fierce, unrelenting fire over your entire being, says the woman. Rivers of pain and persecution will never extinguish this flame. Endless floods will be unable to quench this raging fire that burns within you. Everything will be consumed. It will stop at nothing as you yield everything to this furious fire until it won't even seem to you like a sacrifice anymore. Woof! <laughs> if this was a poetry club, we would have had... My hands are cold, so I actually can't click that well today. This is the woman talking about love. And do you guys see the metaphor she uses? She says it's... Like fire, fam. Take a look at it. I got you a fire. Spoke about this last week. Let me just remind you what I said about this last week. Fire is a great good. And it can give life. And it can be a gift for human flourishing. If it is contained. Why? Because it's powerful. It's awesome in there. It's unbelievably destructive away from the fireplace, where it's not contained anymore. So fire is great good, 
and great destruction because it's got power. Do you see it? And this quote from Song of Songs helps us to understand the power of sex and sexual desire. And this means that sex experienced the way it was created to be in its place and contained for the purposes for which it was created can be a powerful experience in a good way. Okay? Not talking bad sex this week. We did that last week. Talking good sex now. Think about it, fam. God creates, puts everything in its place, creates human beings in His image, and then God looks, listen, at human gendered bodies and says it is very good. Do you see it? Male and female, He created them. There they are, humans in His liking, gendered. That right there is very good very good. So it's important for us to know that when we talk about sex, that it can be good and can be destructive. It's good if it's in the covenant commitment of marriage, and it's destructive if it's abused. And abusing sex means doing it in all other contexts than a covenant commitment called marriage. And there's only those two options. So it can either be good or destructive. You can either do it in the context of commitment, or you can abuse it. Now, we've got two challenges when it comes to sex. And here they are. are. Some people talk about sex as if it's dirty. And as if it's wrong. Some people might even talk about sex as if it's scary. And if it's something that's too risky to engage in. That's one problem. The other challenge we have is some people talk about sex without the necessary respect for it. As if it is the same as eating a burger. Or satisfying a basic human need. Do you see how the first, talking about it as if it's dirty and wrong, keeps you away from the fullness of sex, right? Because why on earth would you enter into the fullness for that which, we, for that which it was created for, if you think that it's dirty and wrong? And do you also see how two, not having the necessary respect for it, perpetuates the abuse of sex, Right? So two problems, and both of those problems have a slide down the one side. We are not the first society or culture to have this issue, fam. Right? We shouldn't think that it's only in 2023 that it was this way. In the time of Paul, Paul the guy who wrote our teaching text, the book of Corinthians, they had two views of sex in his time, or in his culture, or in his context. The one view of sex was perpetuated by a philosopher called Plato, or Plato, if you want to. Plato said, listen, the body sucks. The body is dirty, the body is bad, the body is subject to decay, the body, it can, it, can it feel like an animal? Ignore the body. It's all about what's going on in here. It's all in the mind. And eventually, we want to be freed from our bodies. So, sex is dirty, it's bad, don't engage in it. Okay? We also have a layer of that view, having a a, a lower view of our bodies. And then in the time of Paul, if it wasn't Platonic or from Plato, it was from the mystery religions. And the mystery religions, now that's fascinating if you read up about them. So in the time of Paul, there were secret cults in the Greco-Roman world that offered to individuals religious experiences that was not provided by other religions, but that had sex as part of the religious experience, right? And those mystery religions spoke about sex as an appetite. If you're hungry, you eat. If you feel sexy, you have sex. That's how you roll. And you can even do it in the context of a temple or religion and honor God through it. Both of these, obviously, are not Right. Why? Because you can't despise sex, as if it's wrong and dirty, but you also can't deify sex and count on it to fully and finally satisfy it. Right? That's deify, the English word means making something a god. So, in the time of Paul, when our teaching text was written, these were two views of sex. Okay, now let's look at our teaching text. I've already said that it's Paul. I've already said that it's called Corinthians. So he wrote to a church, and this is a letter with a mission, 
right? Follow along with me. This is a screenshot from the Bible Project overview map of 1 Corinthians. So look at it. You can read about how the church came into being in the book of Acts. You'll see that Paul lived in Corinth for one and a half years. You'll see that Paul got a report that there are big problems with Corinth. And then Paul writes to the Corinthians. He defines each problem. And then he also responds through the lens of the gospel. And then he talks about the problems they have. Problems in relationship, problems in family, problems in community, and problems about their work. And classic Paul, I mean, what a champ. He divides the letter up into big sections, and he writes about those problems. It's a letter with a mission. Let's look at the next one. Chapters 5 to 7 is all about sex. And you'll see what happened there is there was a guy who had sex with his stepmom and then bragged about it in church and said, of course I can do this because I am free in Christ. And then the Apostle Paul goes, whoa, whoa, pump the brakes, dude. Slow your roll. You can't do this. There's a problem. I'm going to have to write to you. And then Paul responds and he motivates the Corinthians to have sexual integrity. And he speaks about our bodies and the fact that our bodies matter. And he also does it in light of the gospel. Look at it. Jesus died for your sins. Therefore, classic Paul. So that's where the teaching text comes from. Paul pretty much said to them, real talk. Let's talk about sex. Okay, first point. Honor your body. Look at the highlights in the text. If I can have the first slide with the highlights on, please. Okay, look at the highlights in the text, at least verses 12 to 13. Paul is quoting some of the sayings of the Corinthians. Okay, so everything is permissible for me is something that the Corinthians said. The food is for the stomach and stomach for the food is something that the Corinthians said. So Paul quotes them to say, I heard you, now let me answer you. Right? And he answers them with, not everything is beneficial and you should not be mastered by anything or I will not be mastered by anything. And then he explains what he means. Look at the highlights in verse 13. You see body twice. Do you see it? You see Lord twice, do you see it? And you see sexual immorality once. So which one is the odd one out? It's sexual immorality. Okay, now, if Paul talks about your body, he uses the Greek word suma, which refers to not only your flesh and blood, but your whole being as one. That is Really important for us to understand now as humans and to understand this teaching text. Why? Because even though we might speak of ourselves as body, mind, and spirit, even though we might be able to distinguish between the inside and the outside on a cognitive level and also on an experiential level, we are still one thing. That's really important. Like, I can't take my body for a run and then leave my mind to do something else. I have to take my mind with my body on this run. And in the same way, I can't pray with my mind but not have my body in a position that looks like I'm praying. Because then I'm not praying. Like, our bodies function as one. So that's a first very important point. Secondly, he uses the word sexual immorality. The Greek word is pornaya. And that means, I've got one simple line for you, any disordered sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage. There is no debate about it. You can try and be fancy schmancy and ask about the Greek word. This Greek word is an umbrella term for everything outside of the covenant of marriage. And then you see that he uses the word Lord twice. Why? Because your Lord is the one who calls the shots. And the reason why he uses the word Lord is because he used the word me twice in the sayings of the Corinthians. So, who gets to decide what I do? 
Paul says, the Lord gets to decide what I do. Why? Because he is the Lord for the body. Do you see it? Body for the Lord, Lord for the body. So therefore you can't do whatever you want, even though you say you can. And also, that's why you shouldn't be mastered by anything, because you should only be mastered by the Lord. Are you following Paul's argument here? Okay. Now, why so intense, Paul? You're being a little bit extra here, dude. Chill. No, no, no. Look at why Paul was so intense about this. Verse 14. Look at the highlight. Will also raise us up by His power. What you do with your body now has future implications, fam. Think about that. Yes, we will have a transformed body from one made of flesh to one made of spirit, but the same person will inhabit both bodies. Paul says it's not like you can just delete one and continue in a new one. You will be raised up, so your body that you have now matters. First thing, there's future implications here. Second thing, look at verse 15. Look at what your bodies are. It's part of Christ's body. Or is it part of a prostitute? Paul says it's either or. But your body is joined to Christ's body. And then verse 17 he says, Anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. Just after he used the words, joined to a prostitute is one body with her. Think about a house. Two bed, two bath. Classic M&T development in Centurion. Yourself as an individual and a housemate. Each one has their own rooms. Each one has their own bathroom. And then one day you come home and your housemate says, Listen, I invited someone new into our house. And that person is going to stay in your bedroom. And that person is going to use your bathroom. And that person is going to put their clothes in your closet. Will you mind? Of course you'll mind. Why? Because someone is going to have to move out. Do you know what I mean? Like we, we only have space for the two of us. And in this room, in this closet, and in this bathroom, there's only space for one. And I was here first, and now someone else is pulling in here. That's exactly the point that Paul is making. You cannot have both at the same time. It is either this one or that one. You are joining your body to someone and something, and you can only join it to one thing. Fam, if we are Christians, and if we are one with Jesus, it changes everything about everything of our lives. Remember, when you crossed the line of faith, you invited the Holy Spirit into your life to be a constant companion, a roommate, to be a constant teacher in your life, to be a constant encourager in your life, to be a constant advocate in your life, to be a constant comforter and power <clears throat> and transformer in your life. When you became a Christian, you, you prepared a place for the Holy Spirit to come and stay inside of you. I alluded to that, the last sermon of our deeper series this year. Why would you forget all of that and do exactly the opposite? Yes, exactly. That's Paul's point. Do you see it? Verse 15. He asks questions. Those questions are rhetorical questions. They're not meant to be answered. But then Paul answers it and says, absolutely not. That's not how it works. Okay. Now let's take some time here. And let's go back to the question in the beginning. How do you feel about your body? Let's go a few clicks deeper. Is Jesus the Lord of your body? I don't know why you guys are looking at me. Paul asked the question. Just saying. I'm just a messenger. 
Is he the Lord of your body? Second question. Are you doing things that are not beneficial to your body? Because according to the teaching text, we shouldn't. Third question. Are you mastered by something other than Jesus as Lord of your body? Is something else mastering your body? Now let me be clear, fam. Breathe. I'm not advocating for cover model bodies, okay? It's impossible for all human beings to look like human beings who make it to the front of a magazine cover. That's not what I'm arguing for. I'm also not arguing that we should all be fitness junkies and wear health devices. I'm also not going to argue for positive living. I'm definitely not going to talk about diets, sleep, exercise, and positive habits now in my sermon. I'm not going to do it. Question of the day was supposed to open up this conversation in your head at least. But I'm going to trust that we are all adults in this joint and that we can make those adjustments on our own in the context of our own community. Here's what I want to talk about. Do you know that you are unique? Come on now. Do you know that you are the only version of you ever in the history of of everything. Do you know that you were designed by God? That you were given to parents in a specific time and a specific place for a specific reason with a specific calling and a specific purpose? Do you know this of you? You, there is nothing unintentional or coincidental about you. Oh, right now, great TED Talk. Now, this isn't a TED Talk. Look at what the Bible says. Look at Psalm 139 with me from the Christian Standard Bible. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. We are gloriously, gloriously made. That's who you are. I had the privilege of visiting the BMW factory once in Roslyn. So I could see how they made a 3 Series BMW, starting with a small steel box that fits on the left rear end of the car, all the way through to a brand, 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 brand new, like brand new, minutes old BMW, coming out on that conveyor belt. I remember the smells. I remember the rush. Fam, it is beautiful to see something that was perfectly, perfectly made. Can you appreciate that about you? Because that's who you are. When I looked at that BMW and I imagined myself driving away in it, I didn't. <laughs> But I imagined it. Because of me appreciating what I saw, I promise you I'll take care of it. I'll follow the manual. I'll do what the manufacturer tells me. Because this car is truly beautiful. Do you know what your manufacturer says about you? Do you know that your manufacturer says, I made you. And I made you like me. In my image. Do you know that your manufacturer says that you are different from the rest of creation? We're not animals, fam. We're humans. <laughs> and the good news about being humans is we can experience joy. We can experience love. We can experience sacrifice. We know what relationships are like. And we can enjoy sex. 
Sex for humans is not mating like it is for animals. It's made to be enjoyed. And we have the ability because of the way in which we were made. If you want to have good and glorious sex, you have to honor your body. Doing things that are not beneficial to your body will break it. Being mastered by something other than Jesus as your Lord will break it. Can you see how this view of our bodies helps us to stay in the middle of the two pitfalls I mentioned earlier? Because if we see our bodies for what we were created for, then we'll see that sex can't be something that is dirty or wrong. And on the other side, we'll take really special care of our bodies. And we won't just talk about our bodies and sex as if it's an appetite to satisfy. Do you see this? So having this view of our bodies is really, really important. Okay. The saying goes, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Have you ever heard that saying? Fam. As a saying that does not come from the Bible, I would like to put my stamp of authority on that saying and tell you that it is 100% true. Think about this. You have got no idea what I see when I look at you. No idea. And I have got absolutely no idea what you see when you look at me. The only thing I have a grip on is what I see. How? useless are beauty standards. Let's talk about it. Because who gets to decide? I mean, we, myself and you, can look at a picture or a person, and I don't even know if you see the same thing that I do. But somehow, this world decides who's beautiful and who's not, and what's pretty and what's not. What a useless exercise. Why would I ever care what you think about me? Because I'll never know what you see. Think about that, fam. As you gaze at your own body, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What do I do if I don't have this view of my body? What do I do if I really struggle and I've got a very negative body image? I'll get to that in point three. Stay tuned. How are we doing? We all right? Um, you went, <laughs> what does that mean? Are we good? Okay. How can we have good and glorious sex? First one, honor your body. Second one, go for glory. Look at the second part of our teaching text from verse 18 to 20. You'll see two imperatives, two commands. The first one, flee. That's a command. The second one, glorify. There you go. That is how you go for glory. You flee and you glorify. Look at it. He uses the word body again. Do you guys see it? He uses the word sin again. Do you guys see it? He uses the word sexually immoral again. Do you guys see it? Paul is still on the same tangent here, right? Same argument, same topic, same train of thought. And then, our brother Paul drops three rippers in here. Rippers. And I put them in red for you so that you can see them. Look at it. Paul says, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, you're not your own, and you were bought at a price. Fam, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a place where the Holy Spirit dwells. Do you realize that if you want to have an idea of how close the Holy Spirit is to you, one can say that He is as close as my next breath. Like, where's my next breath? It's all the way till about you. It's like, it's, it's, it's in me. It's so part of me. It's so close. The, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. That's the first one. Second one, he says, you are not your own. Ooh, hard one. Why? Because independence is an idol for the world we live in, fam. 
on the one hand, we worship the idea that we can do whatever we want on our own terms whenever we feel like it. Paul says, that is not true of you. Imagine myself and Katie, our youngest daughter, approaching the corner of Lenshin and Jean, right down here, a very busy road with multiple phases of traffic lights. What will I do as a parent? I will hold her hand. I will do what I was taught. Right, left, and right again. I'll wait for the light. I'll go to the pedestrian lane, and I will have us cross at the right time. Why? Because Katie is my child, and I have to keep her safe, and I don't want her to die. Can you imagine if we stand on the, uh, the corner of the road and Katie says to me, leave my hand, I want to do this on my own. I will say, young lady, there's absolutely no way. I'll probably just say, stop it. <laughs> But I mean, what I mean with stop it is you can't do it your way. You have to do it my way because you are not your own. You are my kid. Don't be foolish. You need to do what I say to survive in this place. That's exactly what Paul says. You are not your own. So flee on the one hand, glorify on the other hand, and it's because the Spirit lives inside of you and you are not your own. And here's the biggie, here's the biggie. You were bought at a price. Fang, question. Do you know what it cost Jesus to free you? It cost Him His life. Do you know what Jesus gave up for you? The Bible tells us that He became flesh. He gave up His status as one of the three persons of the Godhead, perfectly in unity with the Father and the Spirit. And he lived a human life. He dwelt among us. Jesus experienced the full spectrum of human life. And even in experiencing the full uh, spectrum of human life, he never sinned. Not only did he never sin, he died in our place and he paid for our sins to put an end to all the breaking and abuse of these beautiful creatures created in his image. That's the good news. And Jesus died to reverse the curse and to start healing the very people He created in His image. Through the death of Jesus, He defeated sin. Do you see the word sin? Sin again. The death of Jesus defeated sin. He defeated death because He rose from the dead so that we could live forever if we believe in Him. Jesus paid that price for you. And I don't want you to feel bad about it. I want you to hear that you are valuable enough that He did that for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are that valuable to Him? If you don't believe in the good news of Jesus Christ, as I just explained it, I can guarantee you one thing, and that is that it is the truth. So, if you want to take the leap of faith to say that you believe in this, then you can, because it is to be trusted, and it is the truth. The only appropriate response after hearing this is living for God's glory, fam. Think about it. After everything that He did and paid for you, confirming the value you have, the only appropriate response is, I'm going to live for His glory. Think about the spring box currently on their way to represent us at the World Cup. They were chosen for the badge. They were chosen to represent the badge. They are playing, not for themselves, they are playing for the badge. Any Springbok in an interview, how do you feel about sele uh, being selected for the Springbok World Cup squad? The answer will be, y'all know, definitely, you know, it's a very, very big privilege and honor to play for the Springboks. Fam, it is an honor to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we glorify God through our bodies. Can I tell you a story about the first night that Marie and I spent together? It was our wedding night, and it was in our house 
we got undressed and we looked at one another. And boy, was it beautiful. And then we knelt next to our bed and we prayed. And we thanked God for this gift of sex. And we prayed that night, may you always be glorified through what happens on this bed, between the sheets or without the sheets, and wherever else we'll find ourselves in the world. May you be glorified. That's what Paul says. Glorify God with your body. Some of you might ask the question, how do I cultivate sexual desire in my marriage? Right? Like, I hear you, Song of Songs is awesome, but somehow we have lost the ability to have a little Song of Songs of our own. I believe that we should have the right beliefs about sex so that we have the right response. Okay? So I don't just want to say, change your mind, but I do want to remind you that sex is about way more than only you, according to this teaching text. And we have to start there to cultivate sexual desire in our lives. To say, well, this is what sex is for. And if I respond accordingly, God will get glory through this. Let's see if we can stir up some sexual desire in this place. Do you know what I mean? That's where you start. Okay. How can we have good and glorious sex? Honor your body. Go for glory. Last one, fam. Wait. Give. Repeat. Look at verse 1. So because Corinthians was such a shocker in terms of sexual immorality, some of the people in, Cor in Corinth said, then we should just leave it. Like, let's just skip all of it and wait for Jesus to come back, right? Now in response to the matters you wrote about, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Paul says that's not the right response. That's like saying, we are never going to make fire ever again because something burned down. Okay? Now, obviously, something will burn down if a fire is uncontained, but that doesn't mean that you should never make fire again. Okay? So now Paul talks about sex, and he starts with waiting. That's an easy one. Okay? Wait for who? Well, each man with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. Like, that's it. That's the only boundaries there is for sex. And if you want to learn more about that, listen to my sermon of last week. There's 60 minutes for you to listen to about why we need to wait. I'm not going to explain all of that again. What I want you to see, though, is can you see married folk? That means that sometimes you have to wait. Sometimes you have to wait. Look at the highlights. Each man, own wife. Each woman, own husband. There's a duty to his wife. And a duty to her husband. There's a right over a body. And there's a right over a body. And there's a command that says, Do not deprive one another, except there's one disclaimer. We'll get to that now. Fam, sometimes we have to wait. And self-control is part of the fruit of the Spirit. We are able through the power of the Holy Spirit, to bring our desires under control. Why do I say this? Because there is never an opportunity to do it with someone else in another way. Never. Like you won't find it in the Bible. You might find it on the internet. Or according to someone's really cool new dissertation about why we should do it outside of the bonds of covenant marriage, you won't find it in the Bible. Wait. Two. Give. Okay, now this is important. I need you guys to focus now. Do you see in the teaching text that it is a mutual, reciprocal duty? Mutual means both of us. Reciprocal says one another. It's not me to myself. It's not you to yourself. It's not you to me only and me to you only. It's to one another. Do you guys see it? There's a mutual duty. Fam, I can read Greek as well. I was trained in it. Do you know what the Greek text says? His right to sex. That's what it says. And it says her right to sex. Sure, some of you got really stressed now. 
It's mutual, fam, both. His right to sex, her right to sex. That's what the Greek says. Why? Because it's part of the privileges of this covenant. So give it. It's part of the privileges of this covenant. So give it. You might ask the question, even though I don't enjoy sex, should I now have sex with my partner only to please them? The answer is no. Because it's supposed to be mutual. It's supposed to be reciprocal. It's supposed to be both ways. You are in on it as well. You might ask the question, can I expect my partner to therefore please me? That answer is yes. Because it's part of the privileges of marriage. Hear me, hear me fam. It is a two one another thing. Do you guys know the sport tennis? Great sport, two players, one ball, dynamic. Have you guys ever seen a tennis practice wall? That's not real tennis. That's one person going, ba, 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 <coughs> smashing the ball against the wall, and the wall just returning the ball. That's not sex. That's why Paul says it's a mutual, reciprocal duty. We do it to one another. Okay, side note. Why should we not deprive one another? I think let, let's get to verse 5. Paul says do not deprive one another. Why not? Let me give you three simple ones. This isn't the three points of my sermon. I'm at the third point of my sermon, but there's three sub-points in here. Well, if we deprive one another from sex, we won't have more humans, which is a problem, right? Because that's the way the creation goes. So procreation will be out the door if we deprive each other from sex, but recreation will also be out the door if we deprive each other from sex. Do you know what recreation is? Recreation is something that is so good for you that you feel made new. That's recreation. I'm a runner. It is a recreative activity. After I've went for a run, there's a lot of good stuff going on in my body, and I feel recreated. Sex is the same. When you had it with your spouse, you feel recreated. Because in your body, a lot of things happened that gives you that feeling. And then the third reason why we shouldn't deprive one another is for the purposes of unification, right? Being a unity as a couple. I'll get back to that in just a few minutes. Okay. Why would we agree for a time to deprive one another? Remember, we're still talking about giving. Well, it's to give yourself fully to intimacy with God and to turn all your energies and affections to God. That's the only disclaimer Paul gives to deprive one another for a time. Do you see it? Okay. Do you see what's not there? Work. Yeah, work is rough, eh? Work is just, it's bonkers. We can't have sex tonight because I need to work. I don't know why you're chuckling, it's real. Let me come into your house. The kids are just crazy. Kids absolutely ruin our sex life. Can't remember the last time we had sex because we have kids. People say those things. Sometimes you look at one another and you say, we just don't feel up for it. So you watch another episode or a reel. I don't see Netflix in here, to be honest. Even though all of these reasons that I spoke about now might resonate with you, they might even sound justified to you, they'll cause you to drift apart. And they'll cause you to live in disunity. That's why they are not legitimate reasons for us to deprive each other of it. I can guarantee you without a shadow of a doubt that if you devote yourself to prayer, you definitely won't live in disunity with your spouse. And if you devote yourself to prayer for a time and not have sex in that time, you will definitely, definitely not drift apart from your spouse. So go for it. Go for cold. Like this is a really important disclaimer. Do it all you want. But don't use other excuses. 
Back to the question in the beginning. Are you able to be fully present here and now? As someone who's been married for 11 years and who has two kids, do you know what I've learned? We deprive one another of sex because of the reasons I just mentioned. Do you know why? Because the things I just mentioned hinder our ability to be fully present here and now. They lead us to believe that we have given everything we have to give. And now when I have to give to my spouse in the context of marriage, I just don't have anything more left to give. Fam, we should be very critical of those thoughts and very critical of those feelings. Why? Because work is part of a created order, fam. It's a gift from God. We work to create order out of chaos for the flourishing of humanity. We'll get there in a few weeks. We can't blame our kids. Our kids are gifts. <laughs> they were given to us as gifts from God. And now it's their fault that I can't give you anything in sexual intimacy. We can't talk, of, we can't talk like that, fam. We can't blame those things. A massive part of good sex is give. Okay, go with me. Let's go to the bedroom. Remember I said it's a mutual, reciprocal duty. When you engage in sex, here's what you say. All I am. All I am. And all you are. All I have. And all you have. Giving and being given to one another. Give, give, give. Do you guys hear it? And not only this or only that. All. I'm going to ask you a series of hard questions now. Listen to me. Are you holding anything back in the giving part of sex? Are there things hidden from your spouse? Are there things that you are not willing to give? Are you hiding from your spouse because of fear? guilt and shame are you unwilling to be fully known all of this is part of the giving part of sex wait give last one repeat i said one of the reasons why we have sex is unification so let's talk about unification fam 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 listen 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 when we have sex we are two, and one, and one, and two, at the same time. It's a mystery. Reino and Marie, and Reino and Marie, at the same time. It, it, it is a profound mystery. Not even this clever guy, Paul, had an answer for it. He says in Ephesians 5, uh, uh, fam, this is a mystery. It is a mystery. Because when we have sex, we unify with one another. Then we embody what we said, we embody what we do, and we embody who we are, right? So we are married to each other, now we embody that. We create a life together, now we embody that. We say that we are lifelong covenantal partners to one another, and now we embody that. And every single time you have sex, you unify stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. That's why we have to repeat. Right? Give, repeat. Okay. I'm ready to land. Are you with me? Let's land. Let's go back to the bedroom. In the bedroom, you Hear what your spouse says of you. You feel the cherishing from your spouse after you've heard what they say about you. And remember, fam, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So if Marie says, I look good, I am sorted. Like, I cannot be bothered. 
I cannot be bothered about what anyone thinks. But when Marie says to me, dude, great shape. I am sorted. And then if she touches me, affirming what she just said, I am in the zone. Not only do you hear and you feel, listen, you also say and you touch and you show that you mean what you said. And then we get closer than words can describe. You become one. Fam, that's why we need to compliment one another. That's why we need to speak words of flattery in the positive sense to one another. As I was running this morning, I was wondering if I should tell you guys what I call Marie and what I say to her, but I'm not going to. <laughs> because you guys are going to chuckle every time you see me. But the reason why we use our words and we describe what we see is so that the other person can hear it and then experience it. That's where foreplay comes in. You mentioned it in question of the day last week. Like, what does the Bible say about foreplay? That's where foreplay comes in. That's why we kiss and we caress and we touch, is to back up the words that we say to show that we mean it, so that our spouse can hear the words and then they can also feel it. I want to ask you two really hard questions. Can you receive? Are you able to receive? Because if your spouse speaks flattering, complimentary, complimentary or words of compliments, compliments to you, and you shut them out, or if your spouse wants to touch you and caress you to show what they mean and you shut them out, you can't receive. If you can't receive, how can you give? And that's my second hard question. Is can you give? I said I'll answer the question, what if I have a negative view of my body? Here's your answer. Think of your relationship with God. Let me tell you why. Because you can listen to God, you can hear what God says about you, and you can even feel the presence of God. Fam, you don't need to have physical sex to have this experience. Let me state that again. If you're not in a lifelong covenant marriage with someone with who you can have sex with, there's nothing wrong with you. You're not lacking in any way. There's just something that you cannot do, period. But that doesn't mean that you can't listen to God telling you who you are and how much He loves you. That doesn't mean that you can't feel God. I mean, God is closer to us than a spouse could ever be because He is inside of us. Think about your relationship with God. You can give to God without holding anything back because He'll never be dissatisfied with you. He'll never be critical of you. He'll never say you're not good enough, fam. That's great news. So this, the, the practice of hearing and feeling and this practice of giving without holding back and then this experience of being loved and cherished by God, that will change your negative view of your body. Well, let me, let me give it to you straight. That's where it all starts. That's where a positive view of your body will start is knowing how much God loves you. And that is enough for us. So if that's something that you struggle with, I really want to invite you to lean in, to listen, to hear, to feel, and to learn how to give all you are to God without holding back. Receiving from Him and giving to Him. Being loved and cherished. And then duplicating that with your spouse when you are married. Good sex is glorious. And we can have good and glorious sex by honoring our bodies, going for glory. Wait, give, repeat. Amen. I set a record last week. I set another record this week. My bad. I thought I was going to land on 45 minutes. Sorry, guys. 
Uh, it's uh, 62 minutes at the moment. Let's respond. Can I just say, if you really struggle with this, and if you really need help with this, we have a way to help you. Like, you can listen to these words and think that it's as easy as, let me just turn this way, keep going. These things run really deep. So if you are, in light of last week's sermon, really struggling, and in light of this week's sermon, really struggling, and the context of discipleship groups and city groups and the women's getaway and the men's groups aren't enough for you, please tell us so that we can help you and that we can journey with you. We have access to resources and spaces that can really help. Okay, here's what I want you to do today. Let's all close our eyes and listen to the truth that we should honor our body, go for glory, the weight give and repeat. If this is a view that you want to commit to, and if this is a view that you want to submit to, the time to say it is now. Do not think about a next time that we talk about this, or maybe in a week's time, or I need to think about this first. If you feel the Spirit prompting you to respond, then that response is now. And if that's you today, I want to pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us phenomenal bodies. Father God, thank you for creating us so beautiful with every bone in its place. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for us so that you can redeem our bodies as well. Holy Spirit, thank you for moving in with us and being willing to stay with us even though our houses will never be perfect, and even though we couldn't create the perfect environment for you to move in in the first place, you still chose to live with us. We want to honor our bodies, Father God. We want to give you glory through using our bodies. And we really want to experience sex for all that it was created for in the bonds of marriage. You know who said yes now. And I pray that you would lead them into a season of healing and restoration and the goodness that you have for all of them. We want to see marriages being restored. We want to see all of our folk, Lord Jesus, regardless of marital status, honoring their bodies. May this build us up. May this strengthen us. May this bring new life into our marriages as well. I pray that all in your name. Amen. Amen.